Today I'm going to be talking about the wood white web, which is arguably nature's interconnected superhighway. I've included my website below, thebotanicaldoctor.co.uk. I also have a, a new podcast called The New uh, Botanist coming out in collaboration with the University of Oxford. And I've included my two blogs uh, via Instagram at Andrew Five Galloway and Botanical Doctor uh, for Houseplant Inspirations and Care Advice. Now that advertising is over with, I shall start the presentation. So I studied for my PhD at the University of Leeds, specialising in root soil uh, interactions. Um, so I grew various crop species in hydroponics, so their roots uh, could be sort of examined in sort of great detail. And then I explored how the soil particles and organic matter in the soil interacts with what the roots secrete which I'll get into in more detail later on. Then after my PhD, I did uh, a postdoc at Leeds in the same lab, continuing my research where I uh, developed a novel assay to assess uh, the strength of the soil within this uh, interface. Then I went on to uh, Tromsø, which is in the northern region of Norway, right at the very top within the Arctic Circle. And I was investigating plant parasitism between uh, the dodder or cascuta with its host plants and how that uh, this invasive species can actually uh, consume uh, its hosts by penetrating through the stem and sucking out all the nutrients directly. So it's very interesting. It's a very interesting uh, experience as well, uh, working abroad. So to the bottom right here, uh, this is Drums Talon, uh, where I lived. Uh, so I lived about here, and uh, this is the harbour in Trump. So it was a beautiful place, um, very unique for from a econo uh, ecology point of view. And of course, you saw the northern lights quite often. Uh, again, this is Trump. So here, it was a gorgeous place. But now I work at the University of Oxford. Let's do uh, some freelance science uh, communications work. So in my presentation for the Woodwork Web, um, I'm going to be covering, well, first of all, going to be covering the components of this Woodwork Web, so the soil, roots and fungi. Then I'm going to be talking about what is this uh, Woodwork Web, how climate change will affect it, and how we can protect it and what we can actually personally do and within our uh, own gardens. So now I'm going to talk about the components. So in the beginning, there was rock and water. So before plants colonised land, uh, the land was basically a barren um, landscape. It was just rocks and these rocks would be wellowed by chemical interactions or broken down by the wind or the water rocking up against the um, shoreline and this would be very early soils it would just be ground up rock essentially um, it's very barren um, and this image was taken from one of the new newest sort of formations in hawaii so new island there and i was actually trying to get a completely barren area but we have one individual there was putting my uh, image off. But in the early times before plants, uh, primitive soil was just ground up rock. It was a very harsh environment. So about 420 to 430 million years ago, um, it's believed that the first land plants uh, started to evolve, started to emerge from the ocean onto the land. And prior to this um, sparrow rock, fungi had already colonised the land um, quite considerably uh, long ago, although we're not too sure the exact timings. I don't think we'll ever know the exact timings, but a few hundred million years. Um, so primitive fungi were in this uh, rock and fungi are able to break down uh, rock uh, for nutrients. Uh, so they are uh, able to live in this harsh environment where if you move to the bottom of the screen here, we have a representation of what could be going on 100 million year, years ago. So you have obviously the barren land, we have fungi and their high feet growing in this rock. 
living here. And early, the early ancestors of plants were a type of algae, and it's believed that they would live in the ocean. It's quite a nice environment to live in. You have nutrients all around you, easily accessible. And you're protected against huge weather uh, changes, temperature changes, uh, drying out. And it was believed all these hundreds of millions of years ago, this algae would lap onto the land, would grow and adapt to form into some sort of slime. And then eventually they would form very primitive early land plants, which would be about one centimetre tall. And they would look like a stick with a cup. And this would be known as the Cooksonia. And I was really excited once when I was on holiday to Prague in their Natural History Museum um, that they actually had a fossil of this Cooksonia. But I don't really know if they actually appreciate how important this, how exciting this was, because it was actually placed near the toilets. <laughs> but um, these early land uh, plants were subjected to huge stresses uh, going from the ocean the land, uh, nutrients weren't accessible via the air, they were liable to drying out via the wind, and they couldn't easily get the things that they needed, they had to extract it, they had to develop some sort of early route uh, to anchor into this rock and to try and get nutrients, but they can't dissolve rock. Whereas fungi, they can actually take nutrients out of rock and use it for their growth, and it's believed hundreds of millions of years ago that this interaction between fungi and plants occurred. And this is how it was started off. It was very much needed by the plants and the fungi were more than obliged to give nutrients to plants, especially nitrogen and phosphorus in exchange for carbon, which helps the fungi to grow. So bring you back to the present, a few hundred million years in the future sort of thing. Uh, this is an image of uh, a wheat that's been pulled out of rock, uh, uh, pulled out of soil, and you can see the roots here. This is the stem, roots going along here, and you see lots of soil and some rock particles are stuck to these roots. And this is what's known as the rise of sheath, this root soil interaction phase that I was looking into during my PhD in postdocs. And this is highly complex. So if you go back to the Cooksonia, it wouldn't have had a root. It would be very, very primitive. It would be something that would just stick it to the rock and it wouldn't be functional. Where this is actually very complex. So the roots are taking water and nutrients out of the soil and having sort of a complex relationship with the soil so they can engage with um, mycorrhizae fungi partners, there's parasitic interactions happening. So this is the state of plants now, so it's very complicated. And if you take a microscope and look into this rhizo sheath in more detail, um, like we've done here, you can see the root here, the long root here, and then the lateral root sticking out. And anything sort of black blobs here, this is organic matter in the soil. And anything see-through, this is the silicates within the soil. And we've stained uh, what the plants are secreting. Uh, so this is a thick gelatinous mucilage, uh, mostly made of polysaccharide, um, various other types of carbon. And this uh, serves a variety of purposes. So this helps um, to lubricate uh, the roots to penetrate through the soil. So the tips and caps of the roots they secrete masses of this, or some species do. And a lot of these cells lie at uh, the tips and caps of roots, releasing their components just to help the roots grow fill into the soil. But as well as helping to lubricate, they can actually help to strengthen this rise to sheath interaction. So as you can see in green, you can see the roots structures going along this um, piece of organic matter, and it's secreting, so it's almost clinging on soil, secreting this and holding on further. And you might be asking why would roots want a, a strong soil interaction? Um, and it's purely there to help the uptake of water and nutrients. So in times of drought, some plant species, particularly grasses, can actually strengthen this uh, interaction and it helps it to maintain water and nutrient uptake. So this is how uh, soil and roots interact. Now I'm going to move on to fungi, uh, the final component of the woodwide web. 
So you, you might have noticed uh, these little fungi uh, mushrooms uh, growing uh, in the woods. And this is just a very small proportion of the actual fungi itself. This is just the fruiting body. This is what they do to reproduce. Whereas if you dig down into the soil, you would see these uh, very, very fine white hairs. And this is the hyphae. And this is the, the vast majority of what uh, the fungi is. So you can see these, these are very pretty and they don't particularly last long, but below the soil, it's almost like an iceberg, there's so much going on. So the majority of plants in this world actually have an interaction with fungi, uh, fungi partners, um, known uh, particularly for uh, mycorrhizae fungi, and there are two types of micro mycorrhizae fungi. You've got the ectomycorrhizae, which represents about 10% of uh, the overall, 10% of all the plants that interact with this um, fungi. And then you have the albuscular mycorrhizae fungi, which represent 90% of these relationships. And the key difference is that the ectomycorrhizae in blue here doesn't penetrate through uh, cells. It actually grows a lattice on the root structure. Um, and it can actually go through and in between the cells, but it doesn't penetrate the cells. Whereas the arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi goes through into the root, into the cells, and it forms these arbuscules, these clumps. And this is the exchange point. So this is where the fungi gives uh, the plants nitrogen and phosphorus in exchange for uh, glucose. And here, the active mycorrhizae fungi uh, forms a lattice and gives off this nitrogen and phosphorus on the surface and the plants actually exude the carbon. So the key difference is that the active mycorrhizae fungi doesn't penetrate roots, uh, root cells and this has a slower carbon cycle, so it slowly takes the carbon, um, whereas the arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi penetrates through the root cells, forms this marketplace and gives uh, gets the carbon faster, takes up the carbon, uses it, releases it in the atmosphere, uses it, releases it, etc. And it's a faster cycle. And here we have a more realistic image. This is what's happening in the real world and it's more detailed. Uh, so all the fungi components are stained in blue, um, which is a cell wall component, very specific. And as you can see, these rounded structures here are the actual arbuscules. So these are penetrated through the plant cells and are the exchange point. And then here, the long miniature roots, sort of wavy structures, are the mycorrhizae um, hyphae. And for the active mycorrhizae fungi, if you look in detail, you can see the lattice structure here in white, and you can actually see some of the um, hyphae network here. So now we've discussed the components of this World Wide Web. What is the World Wide Web and why is it so important? So the World Wide Web is the interaction point between plants and fungi. So in this example here, we have a Norweg uh, Norwegian spruce uh, with a European beech. These are growing uh, in let's say a diverse forest and the uh, fungi here, uh, trees usually interact with ectomycorrhizae, acts as a conduit between these two uh, trees. So the fungi forms a relationship um, with this Norwegian spruce and it can actually connect it to this tree, different species, and it can actually give this tree and this tree nutrients which are available in the soil and both these trees give them carbon. So it's a very complex uh, marketplace, exchange point. So it's flow of carbon and nutrients essentially. And I can certainly recommend uh, The Green Planet which was an excellent series um, on the BBC that explored the world of plants and sped up um, plant growth so you can see them grow really fast. It's an amazing series. If you haven't already watched it, and particularly the, the World Wide Web was mentioned in episode three. Uh, so if you'd like to watch it or rewatch it. And again, this World Wide Web was theorized in the 60s, um, but it wasn't until uh, 1997 uh, that this PhD researcher in Canada, in British Columbia, actually 
uncovered this interaction. So it's only found he recently been discovered of sorts. So the Wood Wide Web is a marketplace in exchange for carbon, uh, from your receive carbon and give off nitrogen phosphorus, enhancing uh, plant growth. So a lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus in soil isn't accessible to these plants and this fungi makes it accessible. And as these plants, these trees are all connected and connected on ecosystem scales, they can actually be, this network can actually be used as a communications network. So if one tree in particular uh, here is stressed, it's been eaten by um, aphids or something, some sort of disease, it releases stress molecules by its roots, which can be taken up by this network inadvertently and spread across it. So these trees in the outer layer can bolster their defences um, if this one's giving me a stress hormones. And it's also been uh, recently portrayed in popular media. It's becoming a very popular concept, uh, particularly in this Star Trek discovery, where they use a space version of this wood wide web uh, to instantly travel across the uh, galaxy. It's interesting, definitely interesting to watch. So how does this interaction actually start? How do plants attract fungi? So fungi are attracted by plant roots by what they secrete. Uh, and this collective secretion that plants uh, release is known as root exudates, and it contains wealth of uh, substances from DNA, polysaccharides, monosaccharides, various chemicals, plant hormones, whatever's in the cell is released because of lysing at the caps. And this fungi, there's specific components, I won't go into too much detail, in this exudates that this fungi can detect. And they actually um, grow into the root or on the root uh, via this exudates. And interestingly, plants allow this to happen, they don't actually have uh, a mean response uh, to these fungi. So as I mentioned before, the wood wide web is on an ecosystem scale. Um, it's not on local plants, garden size sort of thing. It is on vast scales, kilometres squared, and some reports have been shown to be hundreds of kilometres squared. So it's on a huge, vast scale. Not just one fungi, not just necessarily one fungi alone, um, an area in the US, can't remember the area, there was a large fungi, that was one fungi that formed this network and it was hundreds of kilometres squared. Usually it's a few different fungis interacting in this complex interaction. So here we have a wood in the UK, if you go for a walk, there's probably a mycorrhizae fungi network below your feet. If you go to the uh, Arctic regions and the boreal forests, in Russia as well, uh, there's a wood wide web. Go to tropical rainforests, there's a wood wide web. And even go to the savannah uh, where there's lots of grasses, bushes, trees, uh, there's a wood wide web. And they vary in diversity, size, scale, it, it's awesome. And over 60% of all land plant species have an interaction with this fungi. So the wood wide web, um, when I discuss this in talks, when I see it portrayed on media, social media, radio, what have you, newspapers, there's always comments that come up such as, it's the unlimited social welfare, welfare system. It's a utopia. Some people have even mentioned plants have created their own society, which is more cooperative than our own, than our own. Nature has evolved something that is better than a society. And perhaps trees should run, run the world. I mean, what harm could they do? But this idea that the wood wide web is some sort of utopia, social welfare system is just not right. The wood wide web uh, is a flexible interaction, so plants can enter it and they can leave it. So typically when plants have sufficient uh, nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil available to them, they don't want this interaction. They cut off the carbon supply and then fungi ends the relationship, but it can also rejoin it. So too little nutrients, plants need nutrients. They seek out this um, interaction by releasing, um, it's theorised at the moment, uh, releasing carbon, releasing more exudates, um, to attract these uh, fungi. 
too many nutrients, ENZ uh, interaction cuts off the carbon supply. You have parasitic interactions, uh, you have parasitic fungi which actually trick plants into thinking that they're mycorrhizae, they take nutrients. You also have plants that enter this uh, agreement, this relationship, and actually take too much and stresses the fungi. Um, when I mentioned it's a communications network, plants can actually release certain um, chemical um, molecules into this network, which can actually damage it or discourage the growth of plants nearby. So, and partners can become too demanding, trees need more, 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 and the fungi just can't uh, extract enough nutrients. But much more research is needed. So this wood white web um, is a very complex interaction that basically we know more on the surface of Mars and lowest parts of our ocean than the actual interaction. Soil is a very, very complex uh, substance, very um, heterogeneous, it's complicated, and much more work is needed. And if you've got money there for a PhD, uh, there's some um, key questions to be investigated. So how plants let other organisms invade their cells without uh, a mean response? So plants somehow can tell the difference between these fungi and actually just actively let them in and then they cut off the supply, so it's very flexible. How communication stress molecules uh, travel from plant to plant? So plants invade, uh, so plants give off these stress and communication molecules via the roots and it's just actively taken in, or passively, sorry, taken in to this network. But we don't really know how it travels. We know it travels, but we don't know how. The extent of species involved, we theorise that it's 60% of 60 of all land-based species interact, but we still haven't fully explored this. It could be higher, it could be lower. And how far resources can travel? Uh, we know networks could be kilometres squared, but can molecules travel that far? Or is it just local? Or how, how far can resources travel? So you might be asking yourself now, how did that researcher or researchers know that the wood white thing, uh, wood wide web exists? Well, it's a very clever um, experiment actually. So I've drawn this um, wood. So you've got the trees, you've got the grasses, shrubs, and then below the soil we have the roots. You've got the hyphae network, the fruiting body growing on the forest uh, floor. But how would you know wood wide web is a thing and how it interacts? Well, what you could do is radio uh, label some uh, carbon dioxide and plants take up this carbon dioxide and integrate it into their structures. And then, of course, if there is a interaction with fungi, the fungi will then take this radium carbon up and spread it across the network. So, for instance, here uh, you have radio carbons, which is traceable carbon dioxide in a bag. You then take a leaf or a couple of leaves isolate them, give them this radio labeled carbon, which is non-toxic. Due to the first processes of photosynthesis, the plants convert this carbon dioxide into glucose, which is also radio labeled. And then it travels down into the structures of the tree and into the roots and into their secretions. And in theory, if there is an interaction between a fungi and a plant, the fungi also take this radiocarbon stuff up and you can actually detect it across the forest. So although you've isolated it in a particular area, let's say here, you'll detect it here, 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 over here in the fungi and then on other trees and grasses. If there's no interaction, so you radio carbons, let's say this area gets integrated in the structures, you'll detect the carbon here and into the roots not won't be into the fungi, it won't be present in other trees. And this is how the research is encoded. So what is the impact of climate change on this uh, wood wide web? So this is a map done, uh, well, made by the Corova lab, which uh, did a lot of work on this. It's a fascinating paper um, showing uh, the distribution of the arbuscular and ectomycorrhizae fungi. So the arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi is more prevalent in the tropical regions. So here we have a scale. So anything in red um, 
is where it's really prevalent and anything in purple it's rarely prevalent so here in red you've got um central america you've got amazon rainforest sub-saharan africa indonesia um this is where most of the upper scale mycorrhizae fungi are from and the ectomycorrhizae fungi are, are more prevalent in the uh, colder regions more northern regions so you've got north america uh, the scandinavian peninsula the uk um, europe japan russia etc so this just shows the current distribution and it's believed that the distribution will be affected by climate change. So the Wood Wide Web networks are starting to convert to a busky and mycorrhizae fungi, um, which have a faster rate of carbon intake. So the from the ticket in and then some parts of this carbon are released. So it's speeding up the carbon cycle, which we really don't want. We want the carbon to really stay in plants in the soil. We don't want it released, taken in release taken in, release taken in, we want it to slow down, which is what the ectomycorrhizae fungi do. It's also believed to slow down the communications. These communications and stress molecules, which are released into the network, will be slowly uh, released across it. So it could affect how plants defend themselves. And it's believed that 10% of ectomycorrhizal species are going to be wiped out because of this distribution change making ecosystems less resistant against further climate change and it's sort of a, it's a deadly cycle almost. However, much, much more research is needed. Uh, we need to learn more about the network and then the effects of climate change because um, we have current targets of 1.5% uh, degrees increase in temperature, uh, degrees Celsius. Any more than that, then we'll be affecting various ecosystems more dramatically. And at the moment, we're on target for more uh, three percent, uh, three degrees increase, which would be quite critical um, to the world ecosystems. So much more research is needed. Loads more PhD programs available. So how can we protect this um, wood wide web? So I've included some images of where the wood wide web would probably not be detected. So in large monocultures in agriculture, the soil is readily tilled, it's disturbed, and you have one species or even one breed of thousands, millions, and it affects the soil and it, the fungi network struggles. In your own personal garden, when you have bedding plants, uh, you let's say plant summer bedding, take it out, spring bedding, take it out, winter bedding, the constant disruption to the soil, it won't uh, create an effective fungi network. And again, with newly uh, created gardens or gardens inside fungi network, most likely won't be there. Um, however, if the soil is not so um, disturbed uh, in areas inside and outside, let's say the Eden Project, it would develop. But with new developments, it just wouldn't exist. So, on a more personal, easier sort of to imagine point of view, how can, what can we do to help this network uh, in our own gardens? We can reduce uh, fertiliser usage, it saves money, although I think gardeners would be a bit reluctant um, because they want uh, more beautiful plants and there's sort of an addiction going on there. We can use slow release organic fertilisers which are available in garden centres. We can use plants such as comfrey, which take up vast nutrients very quickly from the soil, put them into a water bowl, strip the leaves off. It's very fast growing plants and use green um, organic liquid organic fertilizers in the garden. We can obviously reduce pesticide fungicides, which really hamper the development of a wood wide web. Of course, if you have an infestation of aphids, it's very difficult to get rid without these chemicals, although they are organic versions. There are versions that bolster the plant's defences, which are all available in uh, uh, garden centres. We can use mulch on soils, uh, which protect uh, soils from being tilled too much, keep aeration and water drainage, and prevent water loss during the summer. And we can have a diverse garden. We don't just have to have bedding plants or one type of plant. We can have trees, shrubs, 
um, smaller green plant, shaved plants, have a diverse garden, even leave an area uh, to the wild. And having a highly diverse garden is uh, critical in helping the wild webs to develop, helping uh, nature into our garden, which has a huge impact, specifically in this country where there's so many gardens. It's a big impact, especially with bird populations and putting food out for them. You can keep the soil uh, aerated, um, poking holes in the soil, keeping the soil full of oxygen, which is what roots and fungi need. Reduce tilling, reduce hoeing your soil, keep that soil structure healthy, maintain the topsoil, um, make sure there's lots of organic matter going in, and use natural manure. Chicken manure for garden is awesome, horse manure, obviously it smells, but it's really good for soil um, health. So, current agricultural practices. So, this is moving on from more large scale practices rather than in your sort of garden. The use of monocultures, which have a low genetic diversity, really affects the soil. Um, having one species rather than a diverse range of roots, diverse range of species in the soil does affect the wood web. Use of chemicals. If plants have sufficient nutrients or, or too many nutrients, they do not want interaction with fungi. They don't need it. Why have it? <clears throat> and the use of herbicides, pesticides also reduces the reliance on fungi. Forest de deforestation reduces soil aggregates and so how the soil holds itself together. If the soil can't hold itself together, fungi can't really grow in it, or plants. Um, and plants are important to hold the soil together as well, so you're ripping the soil, you're damaging the soil. Of course, tilling, regularly digging up the soil, ploughing in lots of um, secondary products. So you harvest, let's say, the wheat grain, you chop up the leaves, roots, and throw it back on the soil. It really does affect um, the soil uh, flora. And I've seen, there are possible solutions, but obviously mentioning these uh, solutions is a lot easier than actually implementing them. So we can have polycultures, which have high genetic diversity, different types of root mixes, which really encourages um, the wood wide web to develop reduced chemical fertilizers, using more sustainable uh, practices, using organic fertilizers on a larger scale. However, polycultures haven't really been effective at the moment um, compared to monocultures, which are which are highly effective um, at producing food, and we need to produce more food by the end of the century. Um, so these are very sort of difficult topical debates. Um, of course, reducing emissions, less chances of extreme weather, soil erosion, wind, flooding, etc., really affects the soil. Uh, a lot easier said than done. And then reduce tilling, stop it. In fact, a lot of research has gone into no-till uh, farming practices, such as where you plant a crop, you take out the roots, uh, you grind them up into a fan powder, throw it back onto the soil, and it's sort of Tilling the soil uh, for seeds, you just plant them in the soil with this um, organic matter and then put mulches down, etc. A lot of research has been involved, but um, lots of farmers are sort of apprehensive of adopting new practices because if it doesn't work, it costs a lot of money. So there's a lot of work needed to explore the efficiency of doing this on such a large scale and for encouraging farmers to take this up and increases soil stability. It's very important to developing the point where, but again, monocultures. So there's a great balancing uh, act involved. So take home messages. Fungi help plants to colonize the land hundreds of millions of years ago. They're the longest, or arguably the longest marriage in history. Mycorrhizae fungi give plants nitrogen and phosphorus for carbon. Wood wide web is on an ecosystem scale, it's on hundreds of kilometres, if not thousands. It's huge and it's in present, present in most land-based ecosystems, if not all. 
the fungi network is flexible, so plants can enter it, they can leave it. Uh, some plants are very demanding, some fungi are demanding, some plants are parasitic, and some fungi are also parasitic. Climate change is reducing the network's uh, ability to keep these um, ecosystems uh, resilient. Uh, communication molecules, stress molecules are harder to transfer. Um, and ecosystems are converting from ectomycorrhizae fungi to more uh, buscular uh, mycorrhizae fungi, which is speeding up the carbon cycle. Current agricultural practices are killing off or having complete deserts of this network. They just don't exist. And I would like to thank you. So this research uh, wouldn't be possible um, if it wasn't for teams. I haven't done this by myself. So when I was at the University of Leeds, uh, Professor Paul Knox, who led our group, and Sue so Marcus was the lab manager. Um, and then when I was in Trump, so uh, we were led by Professor Kirsten Krause. Um, and then my fund is below the BBRC and the Trump Trump Research Foundation, which funded my work. And yes, um, uh, top uh, right here at the University of Leeds, we were in a, a graveyard. It was the uh, Brontes graveyard, not just anyone. And we used to do trips like that. And then below, this was my uh, lab group in Tromsø. It sort of looks like we're posing for some sort of um, sitcom. Um, yes, and I'd like to thank the Abingdon, Abingdon Naturalist Society for inviting me for this talk. Um, let's talk a bit about plants and the opportunity. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, is there any questions? I'll just pause the recording now. And to add, uh, recently it's been uncovered that marine plants uh, such as um, seagrass actually have a microbe interaction, although it's not the same as a mycorrhizae. It's not believed that mycorrhizae fungi exist in the soil uh, underwater, um, but these microbes are very similar to legumes, um, uh, the legume, legume interaction with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So these seagrasses have a interaction with nitrogen fixing bacteria, um, which is very exciting. It's only fairly uh, recently come out um, and it could be possible that there's some equivalent version of a mycorrhizae fungi present in the marine soils. So let's hope more research uncovers what's happening there. So thanks again. Um, is there any questions? <laughs>